Uh, I'm very pleased to introduce my colleague, uh, Nick Breifogel, who's an associate professor uh, in the Department of History and a specialist in Russian and environmental history. He's the author of four, author or editor of four books and scores of articles in the history of imperialism, migration, religion, and the environment, especially water. Uh, he's currently completing three projects. First, a history of Lake Baikal, am I saying that correctly, in Siberia, the world's largest, oldest, and deepest lake. He's finishing a book on the environmental history of Russia and the Soviet Union in modern times, and a book titled Water, a Human History, which I can't wait to, to, uh, to see. He's been a recipient of the 2011 Alumni Distinguished Teaching Award, uh, and is also co-editor of our monthly e-magazine, Origins, Current Events in Historical Perspective, which you all should subscribe to and read. It's a free publication. I'm going to try to convince Nick to talk more about Origins this evening. Origins is uh, our magazine that takes some sort of current event and places it in some sort of wider, deeper historical context. And I suspect that that's the same sort of thing that Nick is going to do this evening. Join me, please, in welcoming Nick Wright. Thank, Thank, Thank you for the kind introduction. Thank you all uh, for coming. I, um, I, uh, I want to talk today about, uh, I think one of the big issues that we face, or there's many big issues that we face, but one of the big issues that we face uh, in, in the United States and as a planet uh, in, uh, in terms of changing climate, uh, and particularly the impact of that on the Arctic regions uh, of, our, of our planet, uh, and in particular to look at uh, the way in which Russia as a country and Russians as a people uh, are responding to uh, these particular changes and opportunities and this sort of thing. And I will do exactly what David said, is that I'm going to take this kind of contemporary event, uh, this contemporary process, which is of enormous uh, importance uh, you know, to us and to the world, uh, and then I'm going to, to talk a little bit about why understanding more of the history helps us to really make sense of what's happening uh, in the world today. Uh, I am, as David said, the, uh, one of the editors of our magazine, Origins, uh, Current Events and Historical Perspective. I won't plug too much, but it is well worth a read, because it is one of the few places uh, anywhere where you will find uh, in-depth uh, analysis and from a kind of historical perspective of contemporary events, the ways in which history can help us to, to make sense of the world uh, around us uh, today. So let me talk about the Arctic uh, uh, and, uh, and Russia in this race for the Arctic. Uh, and I'll start us in 2003, okay? We got it, we got it. it's hot, it's sunny, but where we're gonna start is uh, about 150 kilometers uh, from the North Pole. We are all huddled together. We have just raised the Russian flag uh, up above uh, a polar research center that has, uh, that has just been set. Uh, and our leader, Artur Chilingarov, this man right here, uh, is raising a gun up into the air, uh, and he fires his pistol up, and he says to all of us who are there, uh, this is our Arctic. This is the Russian Arctic, and the Russian flag should be here. So he's making claim very clearly and very aggressively uh, and militaristically uh, to this particular piece uh, of land and territory. Um, the folks that were there are really, I mean, it's not really the great audience. It's a bunch of scientists who've come up uh, onto the Arctic ice. Uh, they have set up a research station uh, known as North Pole 32. It's, in fact, the 32nd polar research station that the, uh, the Russians or, or the Soviets before them have set up. Uh, on the Arctic ice since 1937. Uh, and it's the first one that's been set up since the collapse of the Soviet Union. So there's been a, uh, a, uh, several years without any kind of polar research going on. But in 2003, they go up, uh, they set up the polar research station, uh, and they declare that this is their place. Uh, and, uh, and then off they go to collect all sorts of scientific uh, data, uh, weather patterns, ice temperature, biology, navigation, all sorts of different things. Um, now. No one around the world pays much attention to the fact that the Russians have done this. The Russians are very happy uh, to be back up at this point, but in 2003, uh, no one pays a great deal of attention to the fact that they have reestablished these research stations. Things were a little bit different just four years later in 2007, uh, because at that time, Chilingarov does something even more uh, dramatic uh, than shooting off a gun uh, you know, somewhere not too far from Santa Claus's house. Um, what he did in 2007 was to organize uh, a trip down to the, uh, the bottom uh, underneath uh, the ice where the North Pole is. 
so they took two Mir submersibles. These are these extraordinarily good uh, Russian-built uh, submersible machines. They dropped down uh, for the first time. Any human had been down, actually, to the bed underneath uh, the North Pole. Uh, they went down there. They picked up some rocks. They did some other scientific uh, experiments. Uh, and they dropped a titanium Russian flag uh, right on the North Pole spot, just to let everybody know that they had been there. Now, the international response to this was immediate and dramatic. Uh, the Canadian Foreign Minister, Peter McKay, literally exploded. I mean, there were pieces of him all over the place. <laughs> he said, this is posturing. This is the true North Strong and free. And they're fooling themselves if they, if they think dropping a flag on the ocean floor is going to change anything. There is no question over Canadian sovereignty in the Arctic. We've made that very clear. We've established a long time ago that these are Canadian waters, and this is Canadian property. You can't go around the world these days dropping flags everywhere you want. This isn't the 14th or 15th century. It really exploded. Uh, John Bellinger, who was a legal advisor to the US Secretary of State at that time, uh, remarked a little bit more uh, calmly, we knew they were going down to the North Pole, but we didn't know they were going to plant a flag there. It was a provocative action. Uh, and it took us all aback. And the Western press uh, was full of all this going on. They called it a stunt fueled by a return to czarist impulses, a Kremlin-sponsored act of bravado aimed at boosting national pride, uh, and on and on uh, and on. Now, then Russian, uh, and again Russian uh, President Vladimir Putin sounded a bit of a note of conciliation at this point. He said, don't worry. I was going to do a Russian accent, but I think they will just do this. <laughs> don't worry. Everything will be all right. I was surprised by a somewhat nervous reaction from our Canadian colleagues. Americans at one time planted a flag on the moon. So what? Well, why didn't you worry so much then? The moon didn't pass into the United States ownership. Chilingarov, by contrast, uh, wasn't above fanning, fanning the flames of nationalism uh, in public. So in one speech, uh, he said, it's only natural that our dive ha had great patriotic impact. And of course we planted the flag, as Americans would do in a similar case. I don't understand why there was all this noise in the international community. If anybody wants to plant a flag down there, they're welcome to. There's plenty of room. And then in Moscow later, he told another group of well-wishers, he says, I don't give a damn what all these foreign politicians are saying about this. If someone doesn't like it, then let them go down themselves and try to put something there. Russia must win. Russia has what it takes to win. The Arctic has always been Russian. Wow, well, huh? Uh, he's uh, pretty clear on what he's thinking there. Uh, and the question we should be asking ourselves right now is, what's going on here? I mean, why, why all of this incredible, uh, explosive, uh, and vitriolic rhetoric? Why are we planting flags underneath the North Pole? Uh, and uh, what we're seeing uh, in, all, in, uh, in his actions uh, and in the response of the international community uh, is the degree to which, uh, uh, over the last sort of 10 plus years, we have seen the uh, uh, the rise of competition uh, in the world uh, over control of, uh, of the Arctic. Now, this isn't a control over Arctic land, per se, um, in the sense that the land uh, in the Arctic territories has been, has been divided up and controlled for, uh, for centuries now. Uh, but this is a kind of race uh, for dominion or for control over the water and the ice uh, that uh, sits on top of the Arctic Ocean, and in particular, the uh, potential resources uh, that sit under that ice uh, and now under that flag. Um, and the scramble that we're starting to see, a kind of race for the Arctic, really involves, oops, really involves uh, five countries that are known as the Arctic Five. Um, Canada, the US, Russia, Norway, and Denmark. Uh, these five countries all have coastline on the Arctic Ocean. Denmark gets it because they control Greenland, at least for now. Uh, Norway gets access because they control this territory here, the Svalbard uh, Islands. So these five countries uh, are, have begun a, this a kind of competition for control over uh, the ice and water of the oceans uh, and the resources uh, underneath. You know, there's three other countries that have um, territory inside the Arctic Circle. There's Iceland, uh, Sweden, and Finland, uh, but they do not have coastline actually on the Arctic Ocean, the way geographers have divided things up. So these, these five are the ones that are particularly uh, involved. And all five of these countries over the last 10 years, uh, well, the last 10, 15 years, uh, have been making a push uh, to, uh, to shore up or enhance uh, their, their control or their access to uh, or their rights over uh, the Arctic Ocean or their share of the Arctic Ocean. But 
Uh, Canada, and especially Russia, especially Russia, as we'll see, especially Russia, uh, have been the most active or proactive, the most thoughtful, the most aggressive uh, in this particular process. And by contrast, the United States uh, has been by far the slowest uh, off the blocks, and to a certain degree has yet to leave the blocks uh, in this race for, uh, for the Arctic. Um, now, the questions that I really want to ask ourselves here are, why do we have this race for the Arctic uh, in the beginning part uh, of the 21st century? And why is it that Russia, of all countries, uh, is so far out in front, uh, or at the forefront uh, of this particular uh, race uh, at this time? And to answer these questions, I want to talk a little bit about what's happened in the last 30, 40 years. Uh, but I also want to take us back uh, in history uh, to, uh, uh, to help us understand the ways in which longer-term trends and patterns of Russia's relationship to the Arctic regions are really affecting how Russia is acting today as well. And I'm going to talk about four big things, and sometimes I'm going to go in reverse chronological order. Uh, we see tremendous amount of climate change in this area, which is affecting the Arctic Ocean and Arctic ice. Uh, this is then unveiling uh, the promise of perhaps extraordinary, this melting ice, uh, unveiling the promise of extraordinary uh, riches and resources uh, that are under the ground, uh, under the water, under the ice. And, um, and it's really, it's got a lot of people salivating over the possibilities. Um, it's driven on by, um, not the TV show Lost, uh, but by what's known as the Law of the Sea Treaty. Uh, I like using Lost because I always thought, I mean, what person at the UN thought, let's call it the, let's, let's have the acronym be Lost for, a, for a, a series of conventions that deal with, uh, uh, with life in the maritime world. But there they go, they got it. So the stipulations of, uh, of the Law of the Sea Treaty uh, are affecting this, and uh, it seems to me particularly important, uh, Russia's kind of long historical relationship to the Arctic uh, is enormously important in terms of determining what they are up to uh, here and why they've been so far out in front. Because, you know, Russia, I mean, in some ways like Canada, Russia is a self-consciously kind of cold place, right? It's a, it's a self-consciously Arctic. When they think of themselves, uh, and I think the same with Canada, when they think about, well, what makes Russia Russia? What makes Canada Canada? Uh, part of it is, uh, is, is, is the cold and is their, their proximity and connection to uh, the Arctic. And all that stands for in the sense of not just, not just cold, but also the ability for the humans there to withstand the cold, to triumph over the cold, to show that humans can master uh, these kinds of extreme and awful kinds of temperatures uh, and conditions uh, where nothing wants to grow. Uh, and in this way, I mean, Russia and Canada, I'm going to keep saying Russia and Canada. Uh, I'm going to talk about Russia today, but there's also and Canada. Uh, you know, see themselves very much as Arctic countries in a way that I think the United States does not. You know, if you want to, if you ask any American, what are the top things, top 10 things that make America, America, they're not going to say, oh, the Arctic, right? Uh, and, uh, but I think that you're going to hear that more often if you ask that question uh, of people from Russia and Canada. Um, and, uh, and, and partly it has to do with, with kind of history and geography. About 25% uh, of the Russian land mass uh, is, uh, is kind of within Arctic territory of Russia. And Russia is the largest country in the world. So a quarter of that then is kind of Arctic territory. That's pretty extraordinary. Um, it holds, uh, the Arctic areas hold, hold a disproportionate, uh, dis disproportionately large uh, amount of Russian resources. Uh, and uh, the Arctic was extraordinarily important strategically during the Cold War, uh, as, as you can see, uh, the distance from Russia to the United States, well, even here, is just is very close. So this was the, the close proximity uh, of the two great superpowers during the Cold War uh, over the Arctic. But as I'll talk about in particular in depth, uh, it's, it's in particular uh, in a kind of cultural realm that I think that the Arctic has so come to capture the Russian imagination. And in particular, it's the polar explorers. Uh, some of the 18th century, but particularly of the 1930s onward, uh, that, have, that have a tremendous fame in Russia, uh, a tremendous kind of popularity. I mean, the rock stars there, they're particularly rock stars in the day. They're still well known now. Uh, they're kind of household names. Uh, and this sort, of, this sort of sense of Russian connection to Arctic exploration, to science, to development, to daring do, uh, to survival in these harshest elements, this sort of sense of this is part of what it means to be Russian plays out uh, in all of the, uh, the events that we're seeing uh, today. So I'm going to talk about these big four things to answer these questions. Why do we have this race for the Arctic 
uh, at the moment, and why is it that Russia has jumped out uh, into the forefront uh, of this particular race? Now, the first thing we have to highlight uh, is, uh, is, is climate change, because uh, the, uh, the, the, the climate uh, in the Arctic regions, the polar regions, but particularly in the North Pole, uh, have been changing quite rapidly uh, in, uh, over the last 40, 50 uh, plus years. Um, what's clear is that uh, the Arctic uh, is warming at about twice the rate uh, of the rest of the planet. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, you know, there's different people have different, uh, and as, sorry, as a result of this, the ice cover is melting uh, or, is, uh, or just simply doesn't form in quite the same way uh, that it used to. Um, what we see is that over the last 20 years, uh, in, uh, in summertime, you can sort of see, I'll show a variety of different kind of graphs and slides from, uh, uh, most of them are from the, the National um, Snow and Ice uh, Data Center. I didn't know we had such a thing, but in, uh, in Colorado, we have the National uh, Snow and Ice Data Center, and they, they track all of this through satellite imagery. Um, and these are a series of pictures of uh, ice cover in different years at, uh, at the minimum point, which is usually in September. That's where the ice is the, is the you have the least amount of ice coverage. Uh, and you can see in 1980 uh, that this is what the minimum looked like. And then you have moments like in 2007, which is one of the lowest points, uh, where you know, if the average is these purple lines, uh, it's a much smaller area uh, that, is, that is covered up. And so what we're seeing is uh, the, um, as a result of uh, a warming climate, warming air temperatures and warming uh, water temperatures, uh, that uh, the ice uh, is, uh, is starting to disappear. Now, it disappears in two ways. One is the sea ice minimum, as I said, is sort of in September. Uh, this is what it was last September, so in September 14. Uh, this wasn't the lowest. 14 wasn't the lowest. You can see it right here. Uh, this is the average, this, uh, this um, black line. Uh, the minimum came in, uh, in 2012. Uh, and, uh, but you can see all the last five years have been well below uh, the, the average in terms of the amount of, uh, of, of sea ice that there was uh, at the minimum point uh, in September. And what that does, obviously, is that opens up a lot of uh, open water uh, for a variety of different types uh, of purposes. So the minimum sea ice is reducing. Uh, at the same time that the maximum sea ice, which comes late February, early March, usually, uh, we've just had in February 25th, they figured of this year, was the maximum. Uh, and this is what it looks like more or less today. Uh, that the, the maximum sea ice is also coverage is also reducing. And you can see this chart here. I mean, there are annual variations, but the, the trajectory uh, or, uh, since basically 1980 uh, has been on this downward uh, line. And so what's important is we have less ice at its maximum, less ice at its minimum, uh, and that the ice in general across the uh, Arctic region is now thinner than it used to be. That's important, right? I mean, it's one thing if it's covered, but it's another thing is how deep is it covered. It's generally much thinner, and uh, there's much less old ice out there. Uh, and what they, what they mean by that is sometimes there's ice that just stays for years and years and years and years and never thaws. Increasingly, we see it thawing and reforming. Uh, and new young ice is much less strong, uh, tends to, to thaw more easily uh, than some of the older ice. And so that there's, we see the changes in, in, in the age and thickness, uh, as well as the, the kind of extent. Um, this is another uh, image of the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, of the maximum we just hit here. Uh, and this is actually uh, the maximum, CS coverage maximum we just hit uh, at the end of February uh, is the lowest on record. Uh, and uh, so, and you can see it's a little bit lower than all, of it, basically the last uh, five years, and if all those graphs weren't enough, here's one more. Uh, black is the sea ice maximum, which is dropping, but not quite as quickly. Uh, the sea ice minimum is the one that seems to be going down uh, extraordinarily fast, but what you also see is the variability, and that's really important. From one year to the next, uh, it can vary quite dramatically. You know, and this is the, the climate is a complex system, uh, and so the trend is clear, uh, over, you know, basically since, uh, since uh, the late 70s. Um, but the annual variations would be, can be quite different uh, and quite uh, dramatic. So, big changes up in the Arctic in terms of ice coverage uh, as a result of, uh, of, of climate change. Now, what this means for the people uh, who are interested in such things uh, is that uh, 
suddenly there's a potential to get down underneath the ice, uh, to get down at the resources uh, that, uh, that they think uh, are there. Uh, and in some ways, there's, there's two different types of resources they're after, uh, one of which is, uh, is what, we call, what we might call kind of extractable resources, fossil fuels, uh, and then a whole variety uh, of different types of minerals. And the fossil fuels is what has uh, all of these five countries involved in the race just salivated. Uh, because what they think is underneath there is, is a massive quantity uh, of oil uh, and natural gas. Um, the U.S. Geological Survey thinks there's about 412 billion barrels of oil and oil equivalent. Uh, Russian sources think there's about 568 billion barrels of, barrels of oil and oil equivalent. Uh, what's important about that number uh, is just what a huge number it is. Uh, so 568 billion barrels of oil and oil equivalent is more than twice <coughs> all of Saudi Arabia's um, uh, uh, fossil fuel reserves. Uh, the 412 uh, it's about three times all of the United States proven oil and gas reserves. Uh, so that we're not talking just a little bit of stuff. We're talking game-changing amounts of fossil fuels uh, for the oil industry uh, and, uh, and this sort of thing. And that's why uh, people uh, are extraordinarily interested uh, in, uh, uh, in thinking about what they can do to access uh, this, uh, the gas and the oil uh, that's underneath. Uh, if it wasn't enough, they also believe there's a, there's a fair amount of diamonds, gold, tin, manganese, nickel, lead, platinum, uh, all sorts of other things. I mean, as they've done experiments down underneath the water, they found all of these sorts of things. And so they're, they're curious to see uh, if they can mine them. Now, the irony should not be lost on us, it's certainly not lost on anybody else, that, uh, that fossil fuels, which are in some ways a primary culprit uh, of the climate change that is affecting the ice, uh, are going to be the windfall this melting ice, uh, and it, you know, this is the, life throws you these ironies, right? And, uh, and this is one of those great ones. Um, the, uh, the second big possible money maker out of all of this is transportation. Uh, and what, what people are talking about is a kind of revolution uh, in, uh, in shipping. Uh, because, as you'll see, being able to sail through uh, what, what the Russians call the Northern Sea Route, uh, shaves off an incredible amount of distance and time and cost in moving goods uh, from Asia uh, to the European uh, kinds of markets. And so um, from Yokohama to Murmansk, which is about right here, uh, it's, uh, you shave off about 5,000 miles, about 20 days uh, of sea travel by being able to go this way rather than having to go through the Suez Canal uh, and this sort of thing. So the potential of fundamentally transforming how we move goods on the planet and how quickly we, you think we get things fast now, right? Uh, suddenly we're going to be able to move things uh, a great deal faster uh, than, uh, than before. Uh, and if it's ever the case that the ice disappears entirely, if you ever get an ice-free Arctic in the summer, then the ability to ship across the Arctic, directly across, uh, shaves off on average 8,000 miles. So, I mean, it's even more of a kind of game changer uh, in, uh, in this sort of way. Uh, for the Russians, uh, being able to access this sea route, this northern sea route, on a more regular basis uh, is extraordinarily important. Uh, it's going to mean a, 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 a whole series of different types of profits for them, particularly from other countries shipping their goods through Russian waters. So, levies, fees, permits, shipping resupply stations, uh, ice breaking, you know, the Russians are the only country that have nuclear powered uh, ice breakers. Uh, those aren't cheap uh, to rent, by the way. Um, and uh, uh, so there's all sorts of possibilities there, and the Russians are building infrastructure all along the North Arctic in anticipation of the ships coming through. Uh, at the same time that, in addition to be able to move kind of uh, Asian goods, through into the European and then ultimately the American markets, what the Russians are also realizing is that they can then get their oil uh, and their natural gas out more easily. That if they can get it up into the Arctic uh, and then move it in any direction they want in tankers, that that's going to be uh, what they call a global energy corridor or what Putin called a floating pipeline. So there's this vision of being able to move fossil fuels uh, in all sorts of, uh, of new ways. Uh, it's of course extraordinarily important for the Russians too, just for, for defense purposes. If you have your navy here, and you can't go across the top, you've got to go all the way through or all the way around to get your navy to the other side of your country. Uh, not easy. 
Uh, and, but if you can do it here, suddenly Russia's ability to protect and defend itself and to move its, uh, its military forces uh, is going to be dramatically changed. Um, and not having to rely on Suez uh, is going to be another big deal, particularly with all the pirate problems uh, in that neck of the woods. So uh, the list goes on for the Russians uh, in, uh, in this regard. Now, transportation uh, and oil and all this kind of extraction are in some ways uh, years, maybe even decades, certainly decades uh, away. So you think about transportation, still only about in, in, a, in a good year when, it's, when this is wide open for a, a period of time. It's usually only about eight weeks, and which is not a huge amount of the year to be transporting goods. It's also the case that no one ever really knows exactly when the ice is really going to be free. It's not the same time every year. So you know, if you're a, uh, somebody in your Bahama who wants to ship stuff, you don't like that, uh, you don't like not knowing uh, when things are going to be able to go. Uh, so we're not quite at the point yet uh, where there's going to be a massive change to using this, but the Russians see it in the future, and they're starting to build for it uh, already. The same sort of thing with oil and natural gas extraction. It's tough up there uh, to, uh, to, to get the oil out, uh, even if it's ice-free. I mean, the Arctic is not a nice ocean uh, in terms of how it treats uh, uh, people and objects on top of it. I mean, it's a stormy... Uh, and uh, a stormy place with, with extraordinarily complex currents uh, that require people who are, who are incredibly knowledgeable uh, to make it uh, all work. The Norwegians are by far the best on this. They develop these incredible technologies for sort of uh, angular uh, drilling, and the Russians are, are making friends with the Norwegians to be able to access this kind of technology. Um, and uh, so, but we're still a fair ways away from that. I don't know if you saw it, 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 a few weeks ago in the New York Times, they had a piece about, you know, Shell had been trying to, a couple of years ago, I mean, had taken a rig up to uh, uh, just off of Alaska uh, that ended in sort of catastrophe because the thing got loose and, and ran free and they couldn't get it back and it ended up beaching and uh, uh, they're heading back up this way. If you're following the news, I don't know, Greenpeace have, have boarded this shell uh, 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 drilling station and uh, you know, high drama on the seas. Uh, but it's tough to, to do up there. So these resources are not today. They're sort of in the future, but nonetheless the Russians really have uh, this, uh, this in mind. So. Why is all this happening now? We've got this changing climate, and which is changing quite rapidly, uh, particularly in the last sort of 15 years. Uh, we have these, these uh, tantalizingly uh, in, uh, huge uh, potential riches. Uh, this helps to explain why we have the race, and this helps to uh, uh, explain the Russian interest in the race. The third thing that really uh, is sort of pushing all of this along right now at this very moment uh, is this Law of the Sea Treaty. Uh, it's sometimes known as uh, uh, UNCLOS or the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. I prefer loss because I just like the irony of it all. Um, and, uh, uh, and so this, this interest in the Arctic and, and, and the activities of, uh, of what I'll call the A5, the Arctic Five, uh, have been pushed forward and accelerated because of the, uh, uh, the stipulations and the terms of the, of the Lost Treaty. Uh, Lost was... was um, Adopted in 1982, uh, and after decades of negotiations, uh, and it does a whole bunch of different sorts of things uh, in terms of trying to regulate uh, human activity on the high seas. Uh, but one of the things it does uh, is that it established just what is every country's jurisdictional rights out from their coastline into the ocean. Okay, so for the first time in 1982, we agreed, most people agreed as a planet, exactly what. Uh, each sovereign state might be able to control uh, out into the ocean. Um, everybody gets a, uh, everybody who has uh, obviously shoreline, uh, gets a 12 nautical mile territorial water zone right here, uh, and then they get a 200 uh, nautical mile, what they call exclusive economic zone. So this is part of the territory, uh, and this is a, a, a zone where that country has exclusive rights to use and develop and profit from whatever happens to be in the water or underneath the land in the water. So there's a bunch of oil right here. We get to go get it, and it's ours, and no one else can take it away from it, and we don't have to share the profits uh, with anybody. Okay? So every country has these, these 12 nautical miles of territorial waters, the uh, 200 uh, nautical mile uh, exclusive economic zone. Uh, and then it is the case that everything else uh, that, uh, that doesn't fall into these categories was considered to be uh, the property of humanity broadly. Uh, and there's a UN uh, uh, organization that was set up to kind of administer uh, any, any 
countries or, or companies who wanted to uh, extract from the, uh, from the kind of uh, shared zone, and then the profits from that uh, would be taxed and shared around uh, the planet. Um, now, what's important for our story here and the whole Russian case is that uh, everybody gets the 200 nautical mile zone, but if you're a country that can prove that your continental shelf, so that's that chunk kind of of land that's under the water, that kind of juts out, that if your continental shelf uh, goes out past the 200 nautical mile zone, you can in fact claim uh, an exclusive economic zone all the way up to 350 nautical miles uh, from, uh, from your shore. Uh, and so, and they set up a commission on the limits of the continental shelf, uh, so suddenly a bunch of geologists are becoming right at the core of, of making big geopolitical uh, and strategic uh, decisions. Uh, and so there's a possibility that you can get you know, all the way out here uh, as your playground uh, to, uh, uh, to work in. Um, so, Lost, uh, set up in 1982, it actually came into force in 1994, that's when the 60th country signed on, happened to be Guyana, well done, Guyana. Uh, and uh, uh, so 1994, currently 162 nations, uh, plus the entire European Union have signed on. The United States has not. It's one of the things that makes the United States very different is we have not signed uh, the Law of the Sea uh, Treaty. Uh, and you can ask me later and I'll tell you why. Um, and uh, so Russia signed on in 1997, and almost immediately, uh, they put in a claim in 2001 <coughs> saying, you know what, actually we deserve more than the 200 nautical miles into the Arctic Ocean, and that in fact this body right here, so this is the Arctic Ocean, uh, this is a kind of picture of what it looks like ge uh, geologically underneath, there's a ridge here called the Lomonosov Ridge, named after one of the great Russian uh, academics, uh, and that the Russians are arguing that the Lomonosov Ridge is actually uh, a continuation of the Russian continental shelf, uh, and that as a result of that, Russia should have uh, access to a much greater part uh, of the waters of the Arctic Ocean than the 200 nautical miles would give. They want the 350 nautical miles, which takes them right up uh, to the North Pole. There are, in fact, three different ridges here. Uh, the Lomonosov is the biggest. There's also the Alpha Ridge uh, and uh, the Gackle Ridge uh, right here. And uh, so you have these sort of three, but the Russians came back and said, you know what? We deserve a great deal more uh, out there. And they took that to the Commission on the Limits of the Continental Shelf, uh, where it has sat uh, waiting for them to make some kind of decision. I mean, these things take time, it turns out. And part of the reason that we have um, the 2003 expedition and the 2007 expedition that I started with uh, is an effort on the part of the Russians to prove that this ridge is, in fact, exactly the same kind of geological entity uh, as the rest uh, of, uh, of their continent. Uh, and the Russians come in really early uh, to make this kind of claim. They're one of the first, uh, they're certainly the first in the Arctic to come in and say, you know what, we want uh, a much bigger uh, share of the pie. Um, just to kind of give you a sense, so the, this sort of dotted line is the 200 nautical mile um, boundary. So all of this area here would be, uh, would be the, uh, uh, we, would not be uh, under the control of any one country, uh, but would be under the control of, uh, of, uh, of basically, of, of humanity uh, and, uh, and this organization that the, uh, uh, the UN Law of the Sea put, uh, put together. But what the Russians are arguing is that because of the Lom Lomonosov Ridge, they actually want to uh, claim all of this water and everything underneath it, and they want this as well, just for good measure. Uh, but it takes them right up uh, to, uh, to the North Pole. Uh, and for years, they were the only ones who would put in uh, this kind of claim. You have 10 years from the time you ratify the treaty uh, in order to submit uh, a claim to, the, uh, uh, to this commission uh, to argue for a greater uh, set of boundaries. So the Russians did uh, uh, signed in 97, but they, they went in in 2001 almost immediately. The uh, Canadians signed in 2003 and the Danes in 2004. And basically uh, 10 years almost to the day, they put in their own claims. Uh, the Canadians came in in 2013. They're also arguing that the Lomonosov Ridge actually uh, doesn't start in Russia and come this way, but in fact starts at Ellesmere <laughs> Island uh, and goes that way. Uh, and they're also making a claim for the Alpha Ridge as being a, 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 a prolongation of their uh, uh, kind of continental shelf. Uh, and lo and behold, 
uh, the Danes through, uh, uh, through Greenland are also making the case that the Lomonosov Ridge uh, is, in fact, comes off of their territory and goes out this way, so they should be able to uh, expand. Uh, the, uh, where the, where the, where'd they go? The Norwegians, uh, the Norwegians have made a slight case to expand, but they don't have the same geological entities under the water to make this particular uh, type of claim. So they're trying to push out a little bit further, uh, and they put their claim in in 2006. So now all four uh, of, the, of the five that are signatories to the treaty have put in a claim uh, for greater territorial control. Uh, the U.S. says not because they can't, because they're not a signatory to this particular uh, treaty. The result of this is this mess, right? You can see the overlapping uh, sort of territories. This is what the Canadians get with 200 nautical miles. This is what they would get through 350. Uh, and they're kind of pushing out. Uh, what's important uh, is that the North Pole uh, and control of all the toys uh, at Christmas time uh, is now being uh, juggled between the Danes uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the Russians. And the saddest thing for all kids around the world is neither the Danes nor the Russians believe that Santa Claus lives at the North Pole. It's, it's a real tragedy. The Canadians or the Americans should get control, because at least we believe, right? That that's, uh, that's, how it all, uh, that's how it all works. Um, so there's all of this mess over who controls what uh, coming out of the terms of uh, the law of the sea treaty. Um, this is not going to be resolved anytime soon, uh, because it takes time, right, to decide these sorts of things. Uh, and there's a whole series, uh, there's I think 76 different claims that are in the pipeline uh, at, uh, at the moment. Uh, and even if the commission is brave enough, and I can't imagine they would be brave enough to try to extract this mess and decide, you know what, this rock actually belongs to Greenland and that rock belongs to Ellesmere Island. I don't know how you do that, right? I'm not a geologist, so perhaps that's why I, don't, I can't figure that out. But if they're brave enough even to try, uh, all they can do is render a decision which is an opinion. They can't force a country uh, so that they can say to the Russians, actually your territory ends here and the Canadians ends there, uh, but that's just sort of advice. And then the Canadians and Russians would have to negotiate with each other. So this is not going to be resolved uh, for a while. What's important about, in some ways about this is that the terms of the Lost Treaty forced all these countries to act quickly. They had a 10-year window at most to be able to act, uh, and if they don't, if they don't put in claims, then they might lose an opportunity to gain access of, to control of these waters. So that there's a jockeying that's going on because of the terms uh, of, uh, of this particular, uh, this, this particular uh, treaty. Uh, and in some ways, that's ratcheting up the whole process. Um, yeah, it's, it's just such a mess. It is just such uh, a mess. Uh, and then, yeah, the US doesn't... Uh, uh, hasn't signed yet, and so is not, isn't able to do anything about this. Now, you would think, right, that this is enough. Uh, these are three really good reasons to get engaged in this part of the world. Um, but it strikes me that these opportunities, the change in climate is the same for everybody, pretty much. Uh, the opportunities for resources are a little bit different depending on where you are. Russia gains more out of transportation, but Canada will gain a tremendous amount out of transportation opportunities through the Northwest Passage, uh, and, uh, uh, and they all have the possibility of extraordinary oil kind of riches. Um, all of them work under the same set of laws in terms of the Lost Treaty. So why, we should ask, I mean, now we have a sense of why we have this race for the Arctic at the moment, but why would, should we ask were the Russians so far out in front? I mean, by 2001, they were already pushing the envelope on this, and they were very clear, and they figured out this whole game way before anybody else had and push forward with their claims to the Arctic uh, in the hope, hopefully, that the early bird would get the worm, uh, and that before anybody else woke up to the fact that this was all going on, that they would have been, uh, I think their hope was that they would have been able to claim uh, certain parts of territory. So why, why, why was Russia so far ahead? Why is, uh, and why do we see, uh, you know, evidenced in Chilingarov in his speech about this is Russian Arctic and always will be Russian Arctic. Russia must win uh, in the Arctic. I mean, why? Uh, is the Russian relationship so deep, so passionate, so aggressive uh, in terms of its engagement uh, with, uh, with the Arctic uh, at the moment? Because ultimately, all these five countries in some ways have, uh, have, a, have play in the same kind of sandbox in this regard, but the Russians are playing differently. Uh, and so what's happened recently isn't enough to explain why it is the Russians uh, are, uh, are so far uh, out, uh, out in front uh, in this regard. And this is where I argue that history is really important. Uh, and, uh, and where, 
uh, along with these kind of contemporary uh, incentives uh, for staking a claim in the Arctic, um, that, uh, that Russia's kind of very forward policy in this region comes, uh, comes from their very long and deep connection uh, to, uh, uh, to this part uh, of the world. And, and it explains why they've, they've, they've sort of uh, embraced or attacked the problem much more vigorously uh, than, uh, than other countries. Uh, and a lot of it has to do, as I, as I pointed out a few minutes ago, with, um, uh, with exploration uh, and the sort of sense of heroism and triumph uh, and national pride in, uh, in Arctic uh, exploration. Because, of course, you know, before the space race and before the race for under the, the, the seas, there was the race to the extreme poles of the planet. Uh, and the Russians were uh, uh, not at the, the forefront of actually kind of wandering up and finding the poles, but between then and now, they have been leaders in terms of scientific exploration uh, and, and in a variety of other ways. Uh, and this, this sort of sense of connection uh, and the sense of pride in their accomplishments is what helps to explain things. Now, this goes back in some ways, I think, to the 18th century uh, with what's known as the, uh, the Great Northern Expedition. Uh, it was, at the time, the largest uh, scientific expedition in terms of scope uh, and size that the world had ever seen. Uh, and it began uh, sort of Russia's uh, scientific and ex exploratory relationship uh, with the Arctic coast. Uh, this Great Northern Expedition did just about everything uh, you could possibly imagine. There were poor people, not poor in the sense they had money, but just poor, I feel, I feel for them, who walked the coast of the Arctic, mapping it as step by step by step by step. Can you imagine these people? I just, that always blows me away. It's like one thing to fly up an airplane, take a picture, and then you know Google Maps and this or these. These people walked uh, to find uh, everything that they that, that, that they could. Uh, there's an enormous amount of scientific uh, research that was done on the flora and fauna of these regions, on the on the nature of the ice. They were searching for a way to try to get boats around here. They tried many times uh, with boats that all got crushed by the ice, and so they realized they got to a point where they said, you know, it's just not possible because uh, they couldn't get boats. Uh, through. And in some cases, they would bring boats up the rivers, and they couldn't get out the river mouth because the ice was so, uh, was so intense and was moving and was crushing their boats uh, and this sort of thing. So they learned an incredible amount about this whole region. It's at this time that uh, the Russians discover uh, North America, right, that Vitus Bering uh, and his ship uh, goes across uh, the Pacific uh, and runs into some of the Alaskan islands uh, where they spend uh, just a couple of hours and then decide it's time to head home. Uh, and it all ends badly for them. Uh, it's a great story if you ever want a horrifying, don't ever explore the world kind of story uh, before bed, because the, the, the boat crashes on this island uh, where there are all these blue foxes that have never met humans before. And the blue foxes love to eat the fingers of the humans who are too weak to do anything else. And uh, so there's all these stories of these sorts of things. But uh, nonetheless, there's volumes of scientific data. We suddenly realize uh, the relationship between Asia uh, and North America uh, all sorts of amazing things, and, and Bering becomes, right, a, a household name. But in some respects, it really takes off. This kind of cult of the Arctic uh, in, uh, in Russian uh, culture takes off during the Soviet period, and particularly in the 1930s. Uh, and it jumps off uh, in great part because of this man, uh, Otto Schmidt, great Russian name, right? Uh, good old Otto Schmidt, uh, man with extraordinary long beard, which I guess you would need up in the far north. Um, but uh, there's a whole series of things that he does that I'm going to talk about. Uh, and so there's Schmidt, and then there's uh, a whole series of Arctic pirates. Uh, pirates. Arctic pilots. People who fly planes, not the guys with the swashbuckling swords. Uh, the uh, Arctic pilots who have all sorts of record breaking flights uh, through and over the Arctic uh, and all sorts of great stuff. I mean, it's a time of tremendous heroism and achievement, and that's how it's pitched to the world uh, in terms of what these people are up to. And in some ways, it all comes uh, because of or through this guy, Schmidt. Uh, he begins, in some ways, really three, three major uh, kind of events in, in, uh, in, uh, in his work that make him uh, and the Arctic world really, really uh, famous. And the first starts in 1932, uh, when uh, he navigates on uh, the icebreaker, the Sibiriakov, uh, this boat here. Uh, thank goodness you'll see, thank goodness for stamps, uh, because I got all these pictures only because the, uh, the Soviets commemorated every event with a, with a new stamp. Uh, I don't know what the world's going to do now that we have no more you know, postal system, but, uh, but there you go. Um, so what's important about the Sibiriakov uh, is, uh, and, and Schmidt, is that what he did is he took this boat, uh, and for the first time ever in human history, he sailed from one side of the northern sea route, 
uh, to the other side. So he sailed all along the northern coast of Russia through the open waters uh, in, uh, in summertime. And he proved to the world that, in fact, it was possible to navigate along the north of Russia through the Arctic Ocean in a single summer. Uh, that you can make it through in one summer. It's the first time anybody had ever uh, done uh, that. And this is where we start to get this kind of tantalizing possibility of <coughs> transport uh, through this particular area. And for the Russians, it was a big deal. And from the, since the 17th century, they'd gone up there in their wood boats, which had been crushed like little matchsticks uh, under an elephant, uh, and people had died left, right, and center uh, in, uh, in, in this kind of kindling on the moving ice. Uh, and then, if to add insult to injury, uh, the first kind of uh, captain and his boat to actually make it through the northern sea route uh, was a Swede uh, named uh, Adolf Erik Nordenskjöld. There's my Swedish accent for you. Um, and uh, he had a, had a steam and steel ship that he took through in 1878, but it required him two sailing seasons. So he sailed partly one summer and then stopped for the winter and then sailed the other part. Uh, so that was a big deal at the time, and really showed that you know, what you could do with steel rather than wood. Uh, but uh, he had to do it twice. Schmidt makes it through in one, uh, one particular year. It was a relatively ice-free summer, uh, and off he went. Uh, and uh, Russia, or the Soviet Union, I should say, uh, is, uh, is, a, is kind of agog in happiness uh, at the possibility uh, that this had happened. So following up on this, they decide to do it again the next summer. Uh, and they're going to use a different ship, the Chelyuskin, uh, and uh, they're going to go through the same route. They're going to prove to the world again that this is possible. The Chinuskin uh, turns out completely differently. It's a huge disaster, but one that becomes a great uh, moment uh, of national pride. The Chinuskin boat, uh, you can see it sinking here, um, was not made to go through ice. Uh, it, uh, it was wide and thin. It had a square hull. It's unclear why they picked a boat that is so clearly inappropriate. Uh, for the activity they were going to do. Was it, stu uh, you know, was it the stupid Soviets, once again, were they trying to save money? Uh, was it that they actually wanted to prove to the world that you could get through with a kind of average boat? Nobody knows. Uh, but the important thing is they tried, and they got pretty far. You can sort of see, again, thank you, stamps. And they made it all the way through. They left in July, but by October, they got caught in the ice. Uh, and um, so they had to figure out what, what are they going to do? I mean, they're in the Arctic Ocean, uh, a long way from anybody, anywhere. Uh, and there are no helicopters, right, to go pick them up. Uh, and they decide, you know, we're going to stay on the boat. Uh, and we're going to hope that the boat, because the ice up here doesn't stay in one place, right? It's always moving. Uh, and the ice over here usually makes its way out into the Pacific. So what they're hoping is they can stay on the boat long enough to get out of the Pacific where the ice will open up, and they'll be free, and they'll all sail home uh, happily. Uh, and they stay there for quite some time. Uh, but by February of 1934, they're starting to realize, so October they get caught, and then from October through February, they're on the boat, just moving through the ice, moving through the ice, jumping off every now and again. Uh, but they start, in February, they start to realize that the, the boat is being crushed by the ice. Uh, and uh, they had, over the months, practiced evacuations. So they had got everybody off, and I, mean, I guess this is what you do, right? There was no Nintendo, and, uh, mm -hmm. and so they, uh, they, they, they did this. And so in the two hours it took for the boat to sink, uh, they got everybody but one person uh, off the boat and all their supplies off uh, onto the ice. So one, one person died, unfortunately, but the remaining 104 uh, got off the boat and are now stranded on the ice with no boat to look after them. Uh, and so the folks in Moscow now really have to figure out what are they going to do. Uh, and, um, and so they decide to do something that has never been tried before. They're going to fly a plane in, uh, land on the ice, pick up people and supplies, and then fly back uh, everybody uh, to safety. Uh, and so Schmidt organized what they called Camp Schmidt. Uh, they built a, uh, uh, they cut out uh, a landing strip uh, from, uh, from the ice. Uh, and then the, the uh, great Soviet aviator uh, up here, again, on the commemorative stamp, Alexander uh, Yapidyovsky, uh, flew up, picked people up, uh, and, uh, and they got everybody off uh, by April 13th. Uh, and this rescue was a huge deal, uh, a huge deal uh, around the world. The Arctic explorers and the pilots became kind of national heroes. Uh, they, uh, they got medals, they got honors, they got to have their pictures up uh, next to Lenin and Stalin uh, during the May Day Parade. And even the New York Times uh, called uh, the Chelyuskin uh, uh, rescue a brilliant chapter in the history of human struggles against far northern elements. 
so around the world, and in fact, uh, Schmidt then traveled the world on a, on a kind of speaking tour, uh, hung out with, uh, with FDR for a while, explaining what had happened and telling his stories and this sort of thing. So it was a huge kind of, not just a national, but international uh, kind of deal that even though, in sort of true Russian, everything had gone wrong uh, and the boat had sunk, it became a great uh, kind of national uh, triumph. Um, and coming out of that, there's two things that, uh, that the Russians get involved in uh, that are important to point at. The first was that I think that as Schmidt is out there floating around on the ice, he starts to realize that it's in fact possible to set things up on the ice as it's moving and then to carry out kind of scientific uh, research. Uh, and so coming off of the Chelyuskin disaster, he decides, let's go up and build scientific, you know, temporary scientific bases uh, up uh, on the Arctic uh, ice. Uh, and so, uh, and this is what becomes uh, known as North Pole uh, One, uh, which they, they opened they opened in 1937. That basically they were going to fly their way uh, up uh, onto the ice. They're going to set up a, uh, a a scientific research station on the ice that would then float with the ice for the rest of the winter. Uh, and at some point, you know, it would they would just abandon it and come home. But they would fly up and they would fly back uh, and they would do extraordinary uh, scientific uh, kinds uh, of research. And no one had thought to try this sort of thing. And no one thought they could even pull it off technologically. Uh, and, uh, uh, and yet, uh, they did, uh, and it becomes the first of, as you can see, we're, we're now at 39, I think. Uh, I may be wrong about that, but I think we're 39. But a whole series of different, um, uh, of, uh, different North Pole uh, scientific stations. You can see there's a blip, kind of a, a moment when the uh, Second World War is going on, then after the Second World War, tons, uh, and then there's a, a kind of interregnum before the kind of post uh, Soviet uh, period. And so we have then uh, this, the development of these drift research stations uh, and, and a lot of what we know about the Arctic uh, in all of its uh, manifestations come from the work uh, that these Soviet scientists did. Again, quoting the Times, they saw this as a great contribution to world uh, science and no one thought that anybody, let alone the Soviets, uh, could pull off this kind of technological uh, feat because they, li they literally flew everything up there uh, and people had never landed really on the ice before uh, in, uh, in this sort of way. So it was quite remarkable. Uh, and uh, a tremendous uh, achievement in terms of science and one that is trumpeted uh, to the Soviet people uh, for the great things uh, that, uh, that they've done. Uh, there's Mr. Schmidt right there, uh, up there. Um, the other thing they do after this is they start to decide they can fly all over the place in, uh, in the polar regions. Uh, and in terms of kind of great polar triumphs, uh, what we also see uh, is a series of pilots doing really long distance flights uh, over the pole. So we're flying up to the pole and landing on it, which is pretty amazing. But now we're flying over the pole uh, as, uh, as well. Uh, so in June of 1937, uh, this man here, shaking the hand of Stalin, Valery Chikolov, uh, he, uh, he was the first person to fly over the pole, kind of transverse uh, over the North Pole. He flew from Moscow uh, to Vancouver in Washington State. Uh, this is uh, 5,288 miles, 63 hours of flying uh, straight, uh, pretty amazing. Uh, and then there's a series of others after him, uh, Mikhail Gromov, who flies from uh, Moscow to San Jacinto in California. It must be nice to get off at San Jacinto, I think, at the end of the day. Um, but, uh, uh, but you have all of these pilots who are flying these planes now over, and again, the, the kind of heroism uh, and triumph of all of this. And what's important is that the Arctic researchers today, like Chiringalov, uh, are, are ones who are really very self-consciously following in the footsteps of these people who came before. Uh, that they see themselves as the descendants, as the children of uh, these, uh, these pilots uh, and the scientists like Schmidt, uh, and that this is part of who Russia is, that Russian scientific research in the Arctic uh, is, a, is a part of that Russian soul and a part of their kind of essence. Um, referring to the 2003 kind of reestablishment of, uh, of North Pole 32 that I started with the gun going off, uh, Putin declared, it's very important that after a break of 12 years, Russian scientists return to the North Pole to continue the remarkable traditions of the legendary polar explorer. So this sort of sense that, you know, what we're doing up here is really following in our own footsteps, following in our own traditions. Uh, and this sort of sense is very clear of... Uh, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of these people uh, and of, of, of them as rock stars. I mean, everybody knows him. Everybody knows him, right? He is 
for what he has done, an extraordinary uh, kind of fellow. Um, so this legacy of the history, this sense of the Arctic as being a, a crucial part of what it means to be Russian, uh, and uh, uh, I think helps to explain why the Russian push so quickly. Because clearly Arctic is on their minds, so in a way that we're not thinking much about the Arctic here. Uh, they're thinking about it, they thought about it early, it's a big part of their sort of sense of, uh, uh, of national pride, of nationalism, of scientific triumph, and scientific achievement. Uh, and so when things began to change, the climate, the resource opportunities, the law of the sea treaty, Russian culture, uh, and the long-standing traditions of Russia's relationship with the Arctic are there to underpin this extraordinarily fast Russian push uh, into, uh, into this particular area. Um, where does this leave us all? That's the question we should ask, coming back up uh, to today. Um, one of the things I think to, to note is that there's a race going on, and there's a push and a shove and an effort for everybody to grab what they can uh, up in this particular area. But what's interesting is there's no war yet. There's no fighting yet. Perhaps that's because uh, you know, the benefits aren't readily available quite yet. Maybe in 20, 30 years, uh, if there's no more ice cover. You know, some people say by 2030, uh, there'll be summers where there's no ice on the Arctic, others 2070. It's all pretty soon, though. Uh, but so far, there's a fair amount of cooperation uh, rather than conflict, and there's a fair amount of working together. Uh, and I mean, everybody's working through this Law of the Sea Treaty. It's not a bad thing that there's, I mean, however flawed or, or it may be, uh, everybody's working within these kind of UN legal limits. Uh, and uh, and in some ways working together. You know, the Russians and the Norwegians, for example, they had argued for years over control of a particular rock in the middle of the water, and they finally negotiated this trade. And, uh, and they negotiated who got to own it. And in return, you know, so the, the Russians got access to some of the Norwegian uh, uh, oil technology, and the Norwegians got promises of being able to move their oil as they bring it out through the Russian uh, uh, North, uh, Northern Sea Route and this sort of thing. So deals are starting to be made uh, between uh, the different countries. Some of the people in the area uh, believe that partly this is the nature of how cold climates work. Uh, that uh, Russia's ambassador for Arctic Affairs uh, argued that, you know, you cannot survive alone in the Arctic. This is perhaps true for countries as well as for individuals. And uh, so there's that romantic Russianness going on. Um, but there's this sort of sense that perhaps everybody's going to work together, uh, in part because anytime anything goes wrong up there, all these countries need to be involved, they've discovered. So they have shared uh, rescue plan systems uh, and all sorts of other things. Uh, that hasn't changed the fact that many of these countries are also militarizing in this particular area. Canada is building a brand new state-of-the-art uh, and quite massive naval base uh, in, uh, in, in, in the Arctic. Uh, the Norwegians have expanded quite dramatically their naval presence. Uh, the Norwegians and NATO uh, organized a few years ago a kind of mock, um, uh, kind of mock, mock defense against an invasion from a country called Northland, uh, which was clearly Russia, and the Russians were not amused. <laughs> Uh, that the Norwegians were, were doing training exercises to protect themselves uh, in this sort of the way. The Russians are, are certainly building not just uh, uh, infrastructure for, for transit routes, but also military infrastructure uh, in this particular area. Uh, and uh, so these sorts of things uh, are going on. Um, the last thing I would say is that, of course, the one thing that uh, does not get discussed uh, in, in any of the deliberations that are going on, for the most part here, uh, among these uh, Arctic five countries, uh, is uh, what's going to happen to the Arctic? What's going to happen to the water? What's going to happen to the, the fish and the flora and the fauna uh, that are living uh, in this particular area? Uh, what about the native peoples? And what's going to happen to their cultures uh, and their, their, uh, their ways of, uh, of, uh, of living? Uh, and there's perhaps going to be more of a fight uh, in those areas than there will be between uh, these A5. Uh, because you know, all these countries, they want the riches, and they want the wealth, and they want the power. Uh, but uh, many environmental groups, uh, native groups, and this sort of thing are pushing back against uh, this. And there's a big push to argue that the Arctic should never be touched uh, whatsoever. And it's an interesting thing, this A5, we're working within the UN uh, Law of the Sea, in some ways are protected by it, uh, in the sense that what the law of the sea does is it bars any other countries from having a say in what's going on there. So in fact, there's actually a large group within the UN now who are arguing, uh, particularly African countries and China, are arguing that the law of the sea should not apply to the Arctic Ocean uh, because it's a special place 
So we have an interesting moment where these, these African and the countries in China are now in tandem with uh, often quite extremist uh, environmental groups like Greenpeace, arguing that the Arctic should be left alone uh, and should not be uh, parceled out and this sort of thing. And it's amazing how it all plays out in this sort of way. But um, uh, so, but the story that's not being told uh, so far, and the story that clearly the Russians don't care that much about, Canadians a little bit, uh, Norwegians more, Danes more, although the Danes are particularly worried that Greenland is going to leave their control, that as, as Greenland gains more oil and wealth, the Greenland will simply separate from Denmark. Uh, so there's all these kinds of things that are happening at the moment. Um, but uh, even though I didn't talk about it today, I think that uh, you know, part of the story that we can't forget is, uh, is what's going to happen to this uh, particular region. And no one is asking the question yet, should we go at all? Everybody's saying, we're going. Uh, and it's a question of how much of the pie are we going to get? And perhaps we need to start thinking, we as an international community, more broadly, uh, about, uh, uh, about that larger question of where we go whatsoever. OK. There you go. Great. Do you have some questions? I would be happy to take questions. I hope I have answers for questions. Yeah. Um, why hasn't the US signed the treaty? <laughs> <laughs> So th this is one of these amazing things that, so at the moment, I think almost everybody in the United States would like to, uh, or at least I shouldn't say that. So I'll go back. Uh, we didn't sign the treaty because in 1982, it was the Reagan administration. And the Reagan administration believed that the, the terms of the, uh, of the treaty that made uh, those parts of, the, uh, of, of ocean wealth that were not apportioned out to individual countries, kind of the, the, the joint patrimony of, of all of humanity, that that was communism, uh, and that, that the Americans could never sign on with any kind of communist thing, that sharing out the wealth uh, and not allowing, and I think partly, partly it was ideological, and partly it was also the case that the US is one of a, a small number of com uh, countries that has deep sea mining capability. And so they didn't want their companies to be beholden uh, to, uh, uh, you know, to, this, to, these, to these UN laws and to the UN organizations and this sort of thing. Uh, and that's really stuck. Uh, and that within, uh, you know, within uh, uh, several presidents in a row now have wanted to, to sign, uh, but they're, they're blocked by, um, by Congress, that there's just enough votes in Congress to, to, uh, who, are, uh, who don't want to sign on to this. In part, it, it, now it's changed a little bit to be more that uh, they don't want to sign away America's ability to make its own decisions for itself. Um, the problem, from my perspective, is that it hasn't—it doesn't allow the United States to take part uh, in these kinds of uh, these kinds of discussions. Uh, and there is the chance that if they wait too long, that decisions will be made without them. Uh, and uh, and what's important, of course, is that once once any one of these countries, and I think particularly with Russia, once Russia controls, is able to say this is our water, they're not going to let in American companies, right? Or at least they're going to tax them heavily. Uh, and so that they'll be able to control who comes in and, and who uh, and who doesn't, uh, and um, and so you know I, I, I think it's a problem. We should sign pretty fast and then then get involved in these kinds of things because the U.S. also has the possibility to extend out or to expand its its possibilities if it wanted to. I'm not necessarily championing that idea if it could if it wanted to. But so it goes back to the Reagan administration, and it's it's kind of kept going through. There's really only four or five countries that haven't signed, and we're one of them. It's really amazing. Afghanistan is one of the others, just from regional kind of efforts, but they're of course pretty landlocked. Um, you know, Uzbekistan may not have signed because they're doubly landlocked, and uh, so it's uh, it's it's we look strange. We look we're an anomaly for not having signed. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, it's, is it the issue where we have the Antarctic Treaty, and so the South Pole isn't really owned by any specific country right now? Um, mm -hmm. Do you think that that thinking is part of the reasoning of non-Arctic Council countries for saying, hey, let's just have the North Pole and the Arctic owned by everyone? Um, or do you think it's more of a strategic move that they don't want to give any advantages to any of those countries up there? Um, I'd like to think that they're doing it for the good of their hearts. But no, I mean, I think that ultimately most of these, most of these other countries are realizing that the law of the sea, and I don't think the people who, 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 um, who drafted the law of the sea thought through what this was going to mean in the Arctic. But really what it did is that it limited, uh, uh, it limited or restricted kind of control to those five countries, uh, which is sort of a pretty big deal uh, that they would have such, such kind of power. And these other countries now are saying, 
you know, we can't have them have a stranglehold on these kinds of things. So, you know, if you're China, you want to move your goods as quickly as possible, and you don't want to have to go through Russian waters uh, to do it if the Russians are going to you know, force you to pay you know, high tariffs or transit fees or this sort of thing. And so I think that, you know, the, the push is, uh, is, again, a kind of economic one, uh, wanting full access to the Arctic. Uh, and, uh, uh, and the ability to kind of transit through those areas without any kinds of restrictions. And so I think that, that many of these other countries want the Arctic Ocean just to be open waters that anybody can use. Uh, and, uh, and because that, that will facilitate their own economic activities uh, more than anything. Um, and uh, I mean, I think there are, there are, there are those groups uh, who are interested in environmental questions. Uh, and they are, um, they're pushing simply to try to protect the Arctic. They see that this is, a, this is one of the few parts of the planet that has been relatively, relatively less affected uh, by human activity. Uh, and that, you know what, if we were just a smart species for once, we would just simply not go there. Uh, and that, so there are those who are making that kind of environmental argument. We should just leave it alone. Uh, and. Uh, and so, but they're, they're, it's a minority of voices. I think those who are kind of pushing against the eight, the Arctic Five, uh, are, um, uh, are doing it for economic reasons and access reasons. Um, it's, you know, the, the, uh, the question of who gets to control those, the, the territories, who gets to go through has a long and, uh, and very fraught history. You know, Canada and the United States have argued for years uh, over whether the Northwest Passage is, uh, is kind of open water uh, for people to, you know, is, is an international passageway or Canadian territory. Because the U.S. has, has against Canada's wishes, has run nuclear subs up and down underneath for, for decades and decades and decades. And the Canadians object every time, saying, these are our territorial waters. We don't want nuclear subs going through our territorial waters. Thank you very much. So the U.S. has said, no, no, those are not your territorial waters. Those are international waters. Uh, and we're going to do whatever we want. Uh, and so there's been, that tension is ongoing. Uh, and I think that, that that sort of sense of wanting access when everyone wants it uh, is a big part of what these other countries are pushing for as well. Yeah. Does the treaty establish any form of adjudicatory mechanism for for, this, for conflict resolution? No, at the end of the day, I mean, so the, 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 the you know, well, it, for, depends on what aspect of the treaty, but in, in this one that we're talking about here, where it's about uh, the extent of your your exclusive economic zone. There's this commission that will decide where the border should go, but it's officially non-binding. Um, and so, but I, I think that, you get the sense that most of these countries believe that if the commission comes down on your side, you have at least a leg to stand on when you say this is really ours. Uh, but there's no, I mean, ultimately it's in some ways the same, the same thing with everything with the UN. You can't force anybody to do anything, right? They're not gonna go to war over these things. They can pass resolutions. Uh, and, and not that I'm, I'm not trying to put down the UN, I'm a big fan, but, uh, but that's part of the nature of, of any of these kinds of things. So yeah, so even if, the, even if this commission agreed on where the border should go, then those countries that are involved would actually have to, to sit down and figure it out uh, amongst themselves and decide whether both of them want to agree to those terms. I don't know how you figure that out, though. I'm aware that the Naval War College and the Office of Naval Strategic Studies have been doing a lot of deep diving. Mm -hmm. In this area, have you coordinated any of your work with them? I have not, no. But I do know that the U.S. is, is changing their uh, their activities. I mean, the Coast Guard, for example. I mean, there's the there's the Naval College, uh, and, and very you know, the whole the whole issue of sea lane change and mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the climactic changes is a significant focus of, of work. The, the immediate former president of the Naval War College is a friend of Ohio State's, mm -hmm. and a friend of the history departments. Might be. Where there's some discussion with them. He now heads up the CNO's Office of Strategic Studies. But, but they're looking at this, this issue. I mean, I'm not divulging any top secrets. Yeah. But I know there's some very significant studies underway up in New York. Mm -hmm. No, that's right. Could, it's be one some, that, could be some linkage with your work. That would be great. I'm just suggesting. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. I had not, I had not realized that personal connection that we had. Uh, but uh, it is the case that, you know, I. Uh, Every time there's discussions about, well, well is climate changing or not, uh, I think that there's two institutions that, that are reacting extraordinarily aggressively in response to climate change. One is the military in this country, and the second is the insurance industry. 
I feel like when you have the military, <laughs> the military the faster than the insurance industry. Yeah. Uh, but you know, but you know, Lloyd's, for example, out of London, uh, has written extensively on Arctic issues because they're starting to see these kinds of patterns, and you know, they, they insure a lot of ships, they insure a lot of trade, uh, and this sort of thing. So, but these two groups are really they're realizing what's happening, and they're changing their practices and their activities, and, and they're doing an enormous amount of research to figure out what are we going to do in this brave new world that is that, that appears, as far as we can tell, uh, is coming. Yes. Uh, how is is climate change a uh, political hot button issue in Russia as it is currently in the States? And uh, if it is, how is it the erosion of the Arctic, which they have this national romance with? Is, is it being perceived as like, we need to stop this now, like we need to invoke uh, harsher regulatory regimes on uh, our industries? Or is it like, well, we're just going to kind of take advantage of this when we can and, and um, try and get these resources out? Um. They have a really interesting and very complicated relationship with climate change. Uh, so R Russia is sort of a fascinating case. So it's a huge country. It has a tremendous amount of, of forest. So the result of that is that Russia is actually a, uh, a carbon dioxide sink. Uh, so that they have so many trees uh, that in fact they ingest a great deal more carbon dioxide than they produce. So even though they're tremendous polluters, right? And they're not, you know, they're burning fossil fuels. They're doing all the things that. Uh, the, the, the just the, the simple nature of their country, the nature, the nature of their country, uh, uh, so gonna work my pun magic there, um, is such that uh, they can actually feel pretty good about themselves. I mean, unlike the United States, which is a huge climate change uh, kind of you know force for for climate change, uh, Russia's not at the moment. Uh, so that for them, they can sit back and say, okay. All right, you know, you guys are doing your thing. We're actually working within the limits that our country allows us to work within. So they can feel okay about that. Um, the second thing uh, is that on a kind of national level, I think that there's a fair number of people uh, in the administration who think climate change is not a bad idea. Uh, in the sense that Russia is a big and northern country, and as things become warmer, then there will be so much more agricultural land that will be available. There will be so many more places where uh, Russians can live. Uh, you know, so there's large parts of Russia that are not particularly hospitable uh, to human habitation. Uh, and this has been one of the great struggles of Russia and the Soviet Union is what, what do you do with all this space, and, and particularly because a lot of the resources are there. So in fact, there are a lot of plans. I mean, they're, they're, they, they take the change very seriously. They see it happening around them. Uh, but they're thinking, okay, this is maybe not such a bad thing for us. Uh, and we're going to adapt our society uh, to the new opportunities that this, uh, that this offers. Uh, and, uh, and so part of that goes into the question of the Arctic, uh, in the sense that they don't just love the Arctic because it's covered in ice. Uh, you know, they, 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 they love it for what humans can do there, right? Scientific exploration, uh, you know, discovery, uh, all these sorts of things. And so now they have new things they can do there, which not only are, 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 uh, are, are great for the economy and great for kind of heroism, great for national pride, uh, but are also going to make, uh, make some wealth, make some power. Uh, and this sort of thing. So they're not, I don't think, they're not worried that the ice is disappearing. They're seeing it as a kind of opportunity. Uh, and uh, now, all that said, there's an environmental movement in Russia that is restricted, uh, and, but is there, and they're, they're worried about these sorts of things. But it's affecting Russia sort of differently. I mean, in the sense that it's, uh, because it's a northern place, it's, uh, it's not suffering in the way that some of the, you know, Countries near the equator are really getting hit, uh, you know, with drought or these sorts of things, or or, or, or the heat that is changing climate practices and making it really hard for human habitation. Climate change is, in fact, you know, facilitating human habitation in Russia. It's going to be the same in Canada. I mean, I think that you know the Canadians are in general uh, very concerned about. I mean, as, as a country and as a culture, very concerned about uh, global climate change. But at the same time, it's going to make a lot a big parts of Canada much more pleasant to live in, uh, right? I mean, you know, it's. Uh, Chilly place. Uh, after I mean, what? Seventy-five percent of the population lives with hundred miles of the U.S. border, right? right? I mean, it's, I mean, that's a rough statistic, but that gives you a sense that you go three hundred miles and it's it's chilly and, and, and tough. So, uh, so that and and this is where you know climate change is. Uh, there are going to be some serious kind of uh, there's going to be some serious uh, difficult outcomes for large parts of the population of the world, uh, and it's going to destabilize large parts of it. But there's other places that, in some ways, it makes human habitation easier. 
Uh, and so that's part of, I think, what we'll see in the future is the shifting of uh, population, this sort of thing. Does that make sense? Yeah. A little, a little scary. But a little scary, <laughs> sure. Well, I'm all about the scary. <laughs> <laughs>